James chapter 1, beginning verse with verse 22. Moments ago, both in word and in spoken prayer, I mentioned the direct nature of James' letter. And even the word stark at times may be appropriate to speak of his directive, directness and his manner of communication. We have all heard that we are to be doers of the word rather than hearers only. But may I ask for your patience as we look at this section which has this topic as its central theme and allow me to develop the passage from another perspective or two that may be both interesting and new for you. So let's read this brief section. There are three occasions in verses 22 through 25 of the first chapter. There are three occasions when James speaks of doers of the word. It's interesting that there are only six occasions of this phrase in the entire New Testament. Four of them are in James and three of them are in this brief section of verses. So plainly, thematically, being a doer of the word is James' concern to articulate. He does so in a way that is arresting, thoughtful, and needful. So let's read these verses and begin to unravel them and see where they may lead in their conclusion. James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. But prove yourselves doers of the word not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word, not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. But once he has looked at himself and gone away, immediately he forgets what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. An attentive listening to the word orally taught or carefully read. We might infer this from last week when we heard James tell us to welcome the message, to receive the word in meekness, and apparently alludes to Jesus' teaching that he, Jesus, is the sower who sows the seed, which is the word of God, And four different kinds of soil have that seed distributed on them. But only one is fruitful. So we think possibly before our eyes move from verse 21 to 22, we have heard all that James has to say. He has told us concerning the word that we are to welcome or receive it with consummate meekness. So we expect another topic and that James will segue into a new theme immediately. But James, in the pause between verse 21 and 22, says something in that pause. Wait, there is something else I must add to your duties as a disciple of Christ. And again, 
clearly his theme three times stated with the phrase doers of the word is carefully understood that a intentful and attentive hearing of the word with interest and with determination is insufficient for a disciple of Christ. Even the most rapt attention given to the spoken or read word is not only inadequate, but is in fact, the words are clear, a self-deception. Now, surely we are not saying, yes we are, that an individual can carefully anticipate the taught word as a means of grace. He or she may read the text for the coming week's message. He or she may be resolute in wanting to hear interesting, well-developed, and carefully applied messages. One might even pride oneself, James is going to say, on attentiveness and care and desire for the Word of God, this individual surely cannot simultaneously be self-deceived. And yet, James says that this is so. Let's look at it in verse 22 and begin then to work our way to the next verse in which we have a striking simile to illustrate James' demanding point. So, again, verse 22 tells us the premise. We'll return to that word in several moments. The premise is as follows. That we are to be, the word prove is not in the text, It is a translation of the verb be. To be habitually, the tense would say, habitually be a doer of the word, not only a hearer. In other words, being a hearer is important, but it's not the only matter that James contests and says that is necessary. Being not a hearer only, but be a hearer. Receive the word with meekness, as he contended last week. And when the seed is sown, have a good and honest heart, Luke chapter 8 tells us in the rendition of the parable of the sower. Have a good and earnest heart that receives the word and with patience brings forth abundant hurt. Yes, James wants us to be careful and attentive hearers of the word of truth. But James contends that if we are consummate hearers only, we delude ourselves. Now, this daring statement bears repetition. In other words, for you and for me this morning, or you would not be here. Both of us, the teaching elder and the communicants and congregants, have an interest in well-developed, accurate interpretations, carefully organized, well-expressed, interestingly given and stated. In other words, we are careful about where we attend because we want to hear the very best teaching that the teaching elder is limited in capabilities, but using all those capabilities that he has to bring diligently, carefully, again with accuracy, with clarity, and with some attempt at logical progression, interesting illustration when that may be helpful, which it will be this morning, 
and we come with some sense of anticipation. We've learned that probably, I think all of us agree, probably if we come with a good frame of mind, if we have prepared, if we are ready to receive the word with meekness, we pretty much expect that we are going to hear something worth our effort to get up an hour early and to come. It's going to be worth it. The minister is careful to prepare all week and probably I'm going to hear something worth my drive to Fernwood Glendale Road. And if we were to be asked about it, we would say that one of our great interests in life is what the Word of God says. We listen to podcasts, to radio messages, some go to conferences and listen to uh, competent and skilled teachers of the Word. And hearing the Word attentively and carefully is of the highest interest to us. We want to hear the Word, and we want to hear it as well explained as is possible. We get up early, we look ahead, we expect, and possibly, even though an exciting game has raged on Saturday night, it may even be that in the narthex after the worship service that we talk about not that exciting game, but perhaps about the message. That can happen. So we would conclude about ourselves, we attend Providence because, among other reasons, because we want to hear the word carefully taught, and to some degree, we believe that to be true about our church. This is the individual that is called a hearer in verse 23. This word hearer, be careful to remember it, is the word used in the Greek language and culture for an individual who attends lectures and listens attentively. In other words, this is a crucial interpretive point. The word hearer that James uses to describe this Christian who may delude himself, the word that James uses is of a careful listener. Remember in the book of Acts that we read, I believe in chapter 19, that Paul was excluded from the synagogue at Ephesus. And where did he go? To the school of Tyrannus. And there he became a scholar at large, a scholar in residence, and took on the main and the appearance of a resident lecturer. And we talked about him lecturing there on the main street, which Greeks called the Agora. And people came to hear him. Remember in the latter chapters when he gave his defenses to Felix and Festus and then Agrippa, we said that in the ancient world before the advent of of enlightening technology, audio and visual in nature, that people paid fees for lecturers to deliver on a particular subject of their knowledge and that it was viewed as entertainment, it was viewed as avocational um, recreation, and there was a large populace going back centuries in Greek, where in the Greek culture, where this word hearer was used of individuals who avidly attended lectures for their personal benefit and entertainment. It was a part of the culture. And this is the word that James uses. Now, I've said a misinterpretation can, can, can occur here. And it's important for contrast that we understand that misinterpretation. 
frequently and in some commentary literature, which is not infallible, the comparison that begins in verse 23 is made between a skittish and inattentive hearer and one who is disciplined and attentive in hearing. In other words, the thrust of James is that some people frivolously and lightly listen to messages, get nothing from them because they are inattentive, careless, their mind wanders, and they're really not serious in their pursuit of attentive listening to the scriptures. But in verse 25, we are given an individual who is uh, disciplined, focused, and ready to receive with meekness the word that is given. And so the sense then would be that the teaching elder would develop and he would say something along the lines of, be careful how you listen. Be careful that you are disciplined. Be careful that you retain. If, unlike some professors who don't care for it, if you wish to take notes, take them if it's helpful to you. And make every effort to learn even what may seem like minutia from the Bible if it applies to the interpretation and is helpful. A minute point may turn the tide in a particular direction. So the thrust of the message then from that perspective, alive in commentaries, but also challenged in others is that what we need to do is be careful listeners. That is not an accurate comparison. The comparison is not made between a careless and frivolous hearer, but between two individuals who equally hear the word of God with intense interest. The difficulty in the comparison is not in the interest level of the hearer, but in what one does with the information, data, and gospel truth that is heard. And so what James does in the next verse, in order to make it clear, is to give what English teachers call, and you have been taught this probably in grade school, certainly in high school, a simile. And I want to talk about what a simile is. A simile is an implied comparison between that is you between two objects, a premise and an illustration. It is a, a statement of comparison using as or like. What makes a simile different from a metaphor? Nothing really in its meaning but in its structure, a simile uses the comparative word as or like. You have a premise, A. You have an illustration, B, which is a simile. You have a premise and you have a simile which illustrates the premise, A. And so when you understand the illustration of the simile, you more clearly understand the premise that it ins that it illustrates. So it's, a, it's, it's an illustration to clarify a premise. The premise here is given in verse 23. There is an individual who is a hearer of the word and not a doer. Once again, the premise, A, he is a hearer but not a doer. But you and I have learned, we've been warned twice now, that the hearer is not a careless and inattentive hearer, but a hearer who is avid in his interest and listens intently to what is being said. But he does not follow through with doing what he heard. That is the premise. An individual is a hearer who has rapt attention, perhaps hanging on every word, so interested is the subject of the premise A. But he is not a doer of what he hears. 
Now we have, in verse 23, the simile begins with the word like. So the hearer who is not a doer is like what? What would illustrate James' point? James says, I'll use a simile to illustrate what I mean. And the explanation or the illustration, which is the simile, which is B, is a, an individual who looks at his natural face in a mirror and then forgets what he sees and implicitly, the scriptures state, goes on without making a correction based on what he sees in the mirror. This is like, it's a simile, this is like an individual who hears the word but doesn't do it. Now let's go, dear ladies, let, let's now, because there may be just a little wandering in thought, so I'll address the most, often the most careful listeners are ladies. There is a phone call, and a church sister has asked you to lunch. Both you and she are devout Christians, and she asks you to lunch. It's going to be a rendezvous at a nice place to dine. It's not where the pastor goes like Boots and Sonny's with his Texas Pete at right hand. It's a nice place, and it's the kind of place ladies rightfully enjoy dressing up and going out. And so the one who is invited, the invitee, prepares to go to lunch with her Christian sister. And before she goes, she wants to dress attractively and nicely. This is characteristic of her, to dress nicely and to present herself well. When she sits down, perhaps at a makeup table, or when she stands before the bathroom mirror, she looks at herself and notices several things. First, her hair is not properly arranged and not yet appropriately brushed. Her blouse, somehow, she's horrified. Her blouse is wrinkled. Why, she thinks, it looks like I slept in this blouse. Then the cell phone interrupts her and she has only put on an earring on the right ear. The left ear does not have an earring. She looks in the mirror and she concludes, my hair needs to be cared for. I need to change my blouse or iron the one I have on and I need to put on my left earring. But in the simile, she hears the dog scratching at the door downstairs, and so she moves to let the dog in. She notices that the breakfast plates are still out on the table. She moves those into the sink and promises herself she'll scrub them later. She notices some dust and, and uh, paper wadded up and thrown on the floor. She picks them up and quickly makes a cursory sweep of the kitchen. She goes upstairs and gets on that nice coat that she bought at Talbot's before it closed. She's ready to meet her sister. When she arrives at the restaurant, she is seated and her sister looks at her. And her sister says, my, that's unusual. Her hair is unkempt. When the waiter comes, she turns to the right and her friend, as she addresses the waiter, her friend notices that there's no neck, there's no earring on her left ear. And then, frightfully, she notices what an hour earlier her companion noticed it looks like she slept in that blouse. 
What took place? She is a fine person. She is a diligent disciple. She is often well-dressed and almost ordinarily presents herself neatly, kemptly, nicely. She is somewhat expected to present herself in that way. But on this occasion, a question arises in the mind of her friend who has invited her. Did she ever look in the mirror this morning? Why? Because had she looked in the mirror, which she did, she should have seen that her hair was tousled and unkempt. She certainly should have seen the wrinkles in the brow that is just below that cardigan sweater. And my word of all things, she must, she would be embarrassed to know it, but she only is wearing one earring. And the conclusion is, this woman has never looked in the mirror. And that is precisely the conclusion that James does not make. This individual has looked in the mirror, but she had too. Both individuals, the one in text 23, verse 23, and our dear sister who has met her friend for a luncheon appointment, both of them were attentive to the mirror. Characteristically, she always looked with care in the mirror. But she never changed and made correction for what she saw. And that is what the simile in verse 23 is trying to, to illustrate. James says, the individual who hears carefully, attentively, devotedly, but does not change his or her conduct to conform to what is taught, this individual, it's not that she's careless. James uses, I mentioned his directness, James uses the word self-deceived. It's translated in the New American Standard, she's deluded. Her thought is, I have made careful preparation, but anyone who looks can see that her Readiness has been partial. She is incompletely dressed and she is sending out an image of one who never looked in the mirror at all. James says that is what the individual is like who gives careful attention customarily to listening to the word but does not put it into practice. And he says that this individual is deceived. I, were I writing this point and were I using simile B to illustrate A, I would not have written deceived. I would not think that that word would be quite the accurate description. I might say forgetful, which he does, but he uses the word deception or delusion. Now we've looked at his simile. We've looked at two sisters in my simile. Now to make a lynching, L-I-N-C-H, a lynching point, consider what he does in verse 26 when he picks up another subject. He says this. He says the individual who does not control his or her tongue is deceived and his or her religion is worthless. What did we say about stark and directness? In other words, an individual may hear what James says in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. The tongue is a restless evil, a world of iniquity, a blaze that is set on fire by the Gehenna of hell. And in the New Testament's longest exposition of the dangers of the poison of the tongue, chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, 
in the longest section in the Bible on the tongue, even beyond that which is stated in the wisdom literature of Proverbs, that the individual who makes a claim to be religious, that is to be a disciple, but does not bridle his or her tongue, that individual is deceived. Not only does he say the individual is deceived, but the individual is, religion is worthless. It's fit to be cast underfoot, as Jesus says in the Gospels. So when we take this interesting simile, both James and my inferior substitute or inferior additional simile, both of them yield in James' judgment a stern and a direct and a conclusion about me and about you when we pride ourselves perhaps whether in preparation of the word or in hearing the word, when we pride ourselves on being consummate hearers of the book that is sacred and yet do not take what we have so eagerly heard and walk out of the narthex with a ruffled blouse, minus one earring, and hair that is disheveled. And never conclude that we are deceiving ourselves. James is telling us with three repetitions of it that we must, if we are disciples, be doers of the word. We must put into practice. So, if we wanted to use verse 26, the individual, I'm trying to help, The individual is going to say, I have a chronic habit of speaking ill-advisedly and rashly and impetuously with my tongue. I have heard from James that it is a restless evil, a poison. It is set on fire by the Gehenna, hellfire of Gehenna. It is a world of iniquity. I must put on my earring, iron my blouse, and comb my hair. I must correct what I have seen in the mirror. And of course, the mirrors of the first century were metal mirrors. They were metals uh, such as bronze, silver, even gold. They were polished, and the image was at least adequate to make an assessment But James says in his simile, the assessment is made, but nothing is done about it. They're looking intently and carefully. As most people are very interested in looking at their appearance, either in a handheld mirror or in a full-length mirror. So individuals are interested in hearing the word. But when the telephone rings and they run out the door with one earring, a carelessly uh, uh, careless lack of attention to one's hair and with a tousled blouse, other individuals are able to see when they hear the unbridled tongue, the criticism of brothers and sisters, the failure to show mercy, the failure to pray. When individuals see the earring is not there and the hair is disheveled and the blouse is wrinkled. Individuals wonder, did that teaching elder ever look into the mirror? And about you as well as about me, are we perfectionists in what we expect from the pulpit but minimalists in applying it in our lives? If so, we are delusional, James says. The word is, he is deluding himself. Our stark and direct friend 
has weighty words. In your bulletin this morning, there is a sentence or two about this entire series. I put it together early in the week because I wanted you to have it in case any of you had been carefully listening, you could go back and refresh your memory. And we learned about the tongue and about wrong-headed and inappropriate criticisms. We learned about prayer. We learned about humility and how that is necessary to receive grace, to deal with our spirit which envies intensely. In one or two sentences, I've put each of these messages before you. But what James would say as pastor of the Church of Jerusalem, what James would say, put into practice what is on that sheet. If you do not and just walk away saying, wow, that was an engaging and interesting series. I didn't understand the relationship of Galilee to the Christian movement. And I learned much about James and Jesus teaching identical themes. I even heard that some interpreters see 19 different times when James in his letter borrows from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. This is an interesting connection. I learned a lot. I like that series. Then go back and read a sentence or two on each of the messages and I and you should ask ourselves, did we conclude that our tongues were not employed in righteousness? That they were rash and impetuous? That they often criticized brothers and sisters with sweeping conclusions about a situation which we know next to nothing? James says, if we don't make that correction, we're deluding ourselves. So, he follows the simile, the illustration of B, that clarifies the premise of A. The premise is you must be a doer of the word, not a hearer. Now he talks about another individual. And his description is briefer here. But it is interesting that he says, beginning in verse 25, the one who looks intently at the perfect law. Here is another illustration. It's not a simile, as and like are not used, but it is an illustration of what he wants us to do. We've learned with some degree of discomfort what we ought not to do. Pride ourselves on being intellectually and theologically stimulated, but doing nothing and walking about with one ear without a earring. So, he now illustrates the individual that he is commending and the practice that he is putting, before, putting forward as the appropriate way to live as a Christian. And that is not only to be a hearer and a careful hearer, but also to be a doer. And the word he uses for looking intently in verse 25 the one who looks intently, there's an interesting usage of this word in the 20th chapter of John. And Peter, and this is from Holy Week coincidentally, it's why I'm aware of it because I'm working ahead on Holy Week messages and trying to prepare ahead so that messages might be clear and accurate and interesting and so that you'll listen to them. But in chapter 20, verse 5, the result of somewhat of an unstated race between Peter and John, they hear from Mary Magdalene that the grave is empty. And John, perhaps more athletic, perhaps just younger, perhaps just more quick and agile in his movement, John outruns Peter. And he gets to the tomb, and the ESV says he stoops down to look into the tomb. Chapter 20, verse 5, John's Gospel. He uses this word, stooping down to look. In other words, 
he's taken with this thought of Mary Magdalene that the tomb is empty. And there's some assumption, undoubtedly, that the body has been stolen. But he's intrigued at the same time because John tells us later that he looked in and he believed. So this is a moment that is romantic and full of intrigue as John outstrips Peter and his fisherman friend is left behind. And John gets there and rather than just leaning up against the stone and sort of casually glancing, he eagerly stoops down and peers in and looks intently. He wants to ascertain the condition of what he now sees to be an empty tomb. How much more interested could he be than that? That's the word that James uses here for looking at the perfect law of liberty. That unlike a handheld bronze mirror, which gives an imperfect image, the gospel or the law of liberty is perfect. And there are some historians that say that the Jews in the first century expected that when Messiah came, he would give infallible and perfect interpretations of the law. And it may be, it may be that his word, use of the word perfect is referring to the fact that Jesus as Messiah in a place such as the Sermon on the Mount, you have heard it said, but I say to you that James is referring to this concept among Jewish people that when Messiah came, it would be what I say to you and it would be a perfect interpretation of the law. And that may be what James writing to Jewish readers, that may be what James is saying, that it's a perfect law because it's been expostulated by the Messiah who is perfect and knows God's will perfectly. The law of liberty we've talked about in chapter 2 and verse 12 simply is a reference to the fact that the message liberates from sin, that one is in bondage natively, innately, originally in bondage to sin, and the gospel sets one free, and so it is a word of truth that liberates one as we read in John chapter 8 if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. But our concern is perhaps not to look at his words that he uses to describe the gospel. Our concern is this statement where there's no adverb. There's an adverb in English. There's not in the language in which James writes. But the translators have, but one who looks intently, just as John stooped down and with a concentration like a laser of eyesight upon what was an empty tomb. In the same way, that's how we are to hear to be a hearer. Remember he said, don't be a hearer only, but be a hearer. Now he's saying with a descriptive verb, means to gaze or to look at with laser intensity, that now he is again commending hearing, but he adds to it, one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it. So our sister looks in the mirror. There is a, an interruption. The cell phone does ring before she's put on her other earring. And she talks to another friend and agrees on what to bring to ladies' fellowship. But she has an appointment with her friend. She returns to the makeup seat before the mirror. She looks and she says, I desperately need a brush. And she makes the part correctly now. She arranges, and she has a clip or two that she uses to hold back her hair on one side. It looks perhaps more attractively arranged when 
it is back behind the ear held by a clip. And because she wants to look well presented and attractive, she slips off the cardigan and goes to her closet and picks a also attractive and fitting blouse, but this one was recently ironed or perhaps dry cleaned. It's not fraught with wrinkles. She puts that on. And then, with hair and the earring out of place, she delicately gets the other earring, puts it on, and looks to see that everything is horizontal and level. Picks up the brush again, makes a final stroke across her forehead, and she says, now I have responded to what I saw in the mirror. I've corrected what I saw when I heard the word of God. Do you do that? Well, there are nine places to begin on that one sheet of paper which I composed on Monday morning. You can take it home this afternoon and read each one and say, you know, I didn't even remember that message. That is probable to happen among perhaps many. Or perhaps when that word still explodes from your lips in criticism of another person, perhaps we should begin saying, this is a bad habit. This is out of keeping with what James says. I am going to apologize for what I said. I am going to retract what I've uttered. And I am going to now make a habit of watching, as the psalmist says, I'm going to set a watch over my lips. And that brother or sister that I criticize so free-handedly, I'm going to stop doing that because there is one lawgiver, there is one judge, there is one Lord who is able to save and destroy. And James says, who are you to arrogate unto yourself the place that God alone occupies and to make an ultimate judgment about someone when God, the judge, is standing at the door? So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that my earrings match and that I'm wearing both of them. I'm going to do my best to put that part correctly where it belongs. Now, it's true that when she makes her way to the car, the wind may blow. James says we all stumble in a variety of ways. And the lapel of the blouse may blow up and look odd and strange, and the hair may not be quite arranged as she intended, but the effort has been made, and just before she slips out of the seat of her car to enter the restaurant, she looks in the rearview mirror again, quickly reaches into her pocketbook, brushes her hair behind her ear again, and straightens her blouse before entering the restaurant. We are told that we are to be renewed and transformed by the teaching of the Word, Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. It is a common phenomenon, particularly perhaps in churches where people are very eager to hear an interesting sermon that they can walk out and say, I heard something from the Word of God today, and I got an insight into the Word today. But the Word is not taught to tickle intellectual and theological interest. Now, it may do that, and hopefully it will do that. But the intent, James says, is not just to receive it with gentleness and not just to be productive when Jesus sows the seed of His Word through his church to the congregants of his body. But it is given for us to obey. And James closes by saying, that is the individual who has been blessed. This is what he adds. 
not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. Would you like to experience God's blessing? Let me give an example. When an individual comes to a firm conviction insightfully that the criticism of brothers and sisters is just plain wrong and the treatment of the brothers and sisters with mercy is just plain right. That individual is set free from the responsibility of uttering judgments. There's a freedom to that. It's not my place. It's not in my job description. I don't need to do it, and I'm sinning when I do do it. So I'm not going to do it any longer. But what I am going to do is have somewhat of a motto, and that is that I'm going to check my ears, that I'm wearing two earrings, one on each ear. And rather than making that criticism, about which I cannot be sure anyway, rather than making that criticism, I am going to show mercy to that person. Even if I'm not particularly warm-hearted toward that person, James says that mercy outstrips judgment. And so what I'm going to do from now on is put on a different hat. No longer am I going to put on the judge's hat. I'm going to put on the hat of showing mercy to people. Those whom I formerly criticized, I will now show mercy to them and serve them as Christ tells us to do. What has happened? That individual has heard with understanding and has delighted and reveled in hearing the extraordinary teaching of James on this in James chapter 2. It's right on your list, the first message that we had. That individual now is experienced blessing. He or she no longer has the burden of making ultimate judgments, but simply the responsibility of showing mercy. And that individual is blessed. But not only is that individual blessed... But the former object of his or her criticism is now blessed because he or she is now showing mercy rather than impersonating God and rendering a sweeping and caustic judgment about a matter that we have only at best partial information. So James tells us that yes, be a hearer. Listen carefully. Look ahead to see what's going to be taught. Take home the message. But James says, if that's all you do, you are deceiving yourself. You must put it into practice. And if you do become a doer of the word, remember half the occasions in the New Testament for doers of the word is right in this section in these three verses then an individual who does the word, it is there, not in intellectual and theological stimulation, but it is in a change of conduct that renews and transforms our character. And in that way, hearing the word and doing the word becomes a blessing to you and a blessing to those who know you. So, We've got a tall order before us now, and these are just nine illustrations. We hear 50, 50 examples a year just in the morning. So it is not sufficient for me to discern and to spend 30 hours working on a presentation of a particular passage and then for me not to put it into practice. I'm just deceiving myself, thinking that giving the message is somehow an accomplishment. The accomplishment is in obeying the message and in that to experience blessing and to be a blessing to others. So the next time you hear a message, 
check your earrings, check your blouse, check the mirror and see that your hair is properly combed and arranged. And then if the wind does blow and, and slightly alter the coiffure that you have, look in the rearview mirror, keep your little New Testament in the car and check it and correct it and begin a new habit of obeying the Word of God and in habituating yourself to being obedient, not only a hearer but a doer, God, James says, will richly bless you. I love you very much, and I'm only telling you what I tell myself. I want to put into practice what I learned from the Scriptures, and I want you to do that too. Let us pray. Father, we are so flawed. We can take the most interesting and moving message and translate it into a sense of self-satisfaction and enjoyment and pride ourselves that we go to a church where the Word is taught. But perhaps there are times when we deceive ourselves by this rationale and we have become not an effectual doer of the word, but a hearer only. So remind us that we are to be doers of the word. And Lord, remember our weaknesses. Remember that James says that I and we stumble in a variety of ways. Remember that obedience does not always come easy to us. At times we have to alter the very essence of our character to try to come into conformity with the standards that Jesus taught in Galilee. But do give us, Lord, an understanding of what is required. Help us not to delude ourselves, but to put into practice the word that is taught. And finally, forgive us and have mercy on us, Lord. Lord, have mercy on us. In Jesus' name, amen.